Uh, so my name is David Houston. I'm from Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Today we're going to be talking about naloxone, uh, which is a very interesting development in the field of harm reduction. I have two excellent guests here from Scotland. Uh, so I'd like to let them introduce themselves. So I'll start with Stephen here. Uh, thanks, David. My name is uh, Stephen Malloy. I'm the national coordinator for the Take Home Naloxone program here in Scotland. Thank you, and my name is Kirsten Horsburgh and I'm currently working with the Addiction Service in the Scottish Borders. Okay, so uh, those are our guests. Just to sort of set uh, the ground rules, not ground rules, but uh, basically what we want you guys to do out there. We want to hear what you're thinking. Um, so we've set up a Twitter hashtag, uh, Twitter hashtag <laughs> CSSDP. <laughs> so we want to hear what you're thinking, want to hear your thoughts. Uh, any questions you might have as we go through the interview um, and just attach it to hashtag CSSDP and we'll have it show up here. We've got an iPhone working. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to go through a, different, a couple different things. We're going to incorporate some questions that were posted on our Facebook page, um, but we don't have access to the Facebook page. So please, uh, everything on Twitter uh, at the moment. So um, we're going to start at the top here. Um, naloxone is going to be the, fo the focus of it, but before we can really talk about naloxone, uh, we need to sort of get a bit of a background on drug-related deaths, yeah, we do, we do. Um, which is the reason why naloxone exists. So, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about drug-related deaths? Sure, and, sure. Yeah. I think if we begin by um, looking at the situation in terms of drugs-related deaths globally, um, then based on the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, World Drug Report, um, you know, they estimate somewhere in the region of 250,000 people will lose their lives uh, in the next 12 month period um, to a drugs related death. Uh, and tragically, more than half of those deaths will be overdoses um, involving opiate based drugs. It's also the case that across Europe, you know, we typically see between 7,000 uh, 7, and 8,000 drugs related deaths every year. Um, and in Scotland, unfortunately, we witness somewhere in the region of 500 drugs-related deaths every year. And again, you know, a huge proportion of these deaths are opiate-related overdoses. Okay. Um, we're conscious from, from a, a small piece of research that we looked at there that in North America, we're talking about 45,000 or so people lose their lives in, in any given year. Um, now, coming back to the figure that the UNODC report, we have to be mindful that uh, these figures are compiled based on the countries who actually collect that information and who uh, report that information. So in all likelihood, the figure is far greater, far yeah. greater, because in many countries they don't, they simply don't collect that data, so, okay. so it's a huge problem. Um, so Let's talk a little bit more specifically about um, North America compared to Europe. Yeah. Um, and North America, obviously Canada is exactly the same as the States, but um, there's, there's some major differences across the Atlantic. Yeah. Well, it appears that one of the significant differences uh, in your home country mm -hmm. uh, compared to our own is the, the use and abuse of prescription medications. Mm -hmm. um, typically in Scotland, as, as, as many people would be aware, you know, heroin is a major problem. Um, heroin that is uh, produced, manufactured, typically in Afghanistan and surrounding regions, which finds its way uh, all through Europe, up into the, the, the kind of uh, former Soviet kind of states, into Russia, but of course into Western Europe um, and indeed Scotland. In your country, uh, prescription medications um, seem to be the number one killer when it comes to um, overdoses. And it's been well reported that that's the case in, in um, the United States. Mm -hmm. Prescription drug overdoses now, uh, you know, kill more people, younger people in particular, than road traffic accidents. You know, so this is a this is an issue of of, of huge significance in uh, in North America, and and it's great that, that there are activities to address this, but of course more more needs to be done. And just in your work, your work is not just um, focused on drugs. You've also specifically, it's you know, it's about suicide prevention as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, the actual post um, that, that I wrote with uh, the Scottish Drugs Forum is the critical incidents post, uh, which is, is how it's described. Um, and that post looks at 
all causes of drugs-related death, excluding blood-borne viruses. We have a, a separate uh, project within SDF that looks at that. So my focus is suicide prevention, um, obviously overdose, drugs-related death prevention as a result of overdose, um, and bacterial infections that drug users often experience through Intravenous. Yeah, intravenous use yeah, or, or intramuscular use, which mm -hmm. sometimes goes on. But, you know, we even have people who will sometimes crush down uh, tablet form medication and will inject that. Right. Um, and that causes lots and lots of problems for people here in this country. So it's trying to, to uh, widen it and not simply focus on overdoses yet. Um, so where, where I was trying to go with that is there's sort of a background to yeah. all of this, right? And um, we want to talk a bit about the risk factors. Certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, typically what we see, and uh, Kirsten can, can obviously talk to this as well, you know, for the majority of people who die of drug-related death in Scotland, they are older drug users. Okay. So they are people who maybe have 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years of, of drug use history behind them. Mm -hmm. um, Typically, they are individuals who, who have been in receipt of opiate substitution therapies, drugs like methadone and buprenorphine. Um, typically, it's injecting drug users, but not always, not always. In fact, maybe 40% or so of the drugs-related deaths weren't injectors. Okay. So this isn't a problem exclusively for injectors. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very rare that we see a drugs-related death where only one substance is found in the person's body. Um, mm -hmm at post-mortem and toxicology. So we always see multiple substances being used, polysubstance use. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to this, the other massive risk factor that we're well aware of is a, re a reduced tolerance. So someone who leaves prison may have a reduced tolerance and is therefore at far greater risk of, of overdose death. Mm -hmm. So we know these risk factors exist and we have to do a great deal of work around this, of course. Okay. Um, so. Uh, another another something we we went over this a bit, but you also want you said it's usually depressants that are uh, yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what it is about about Scotland. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's Scotland in particular, but okay. certainly it, it, it is the case that uh, central nervous system depressant drugs seem to be the ones that people choose to to use more, okay. or at least those. Uh, the individuals who use those drugs are the people who then present to drug services. We have a massive cocaine issue in Scotland. But the folks that use that drug, and it runs at twice the prevalence to heroin, so mm -hmm. twice as many people using coke, um, they don't necessarily present to drug services. Okay. It tends to be people from uh, the lower socioeconomic, more deprived areas of Scotland who find themselves using drugs like um, heroin, uh, alcohol, and benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are a massive problem in this, this okay. country, unfortunately. So, so yeah, depressants, down on drugs. So the, the, I think to where you were sort of going with this, could, would it be safe to say that the profile of the Scottish um, drug problem uh, issue has really informed where policy has gone as well? Uh, particularly around drugs related deaths, okay. yeah. We are fortunate in Scotland that for the past almost a decade, there have been expert advisory groups um, who inform uh, our policy makers and our government. Mm -hmm. Currently we have a national forum on drugs related deaths. So this is a, a group okay. comprised of uh, experts. Yeah, sorry, just to clear this up, sure. national you mean Scotland? I mean right. Scotland, right. yeah. Okay. Um, because for, Canada we have provinces, yeah. but Canada, Scott, the UK has countries. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, and there's a beautiful picture there yes. of <laughs> a wonderful country, um, as you can see. But yeah, we have a, a Scotland has devolved from the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. um, but many, many issues um, are reserved to the Westminster government in England, so okay. we don't have a great deal of say over them. This National Forum advises the Scottish government, not the Westminster government. Okay. Um, and it's it's through many of their efforts that we have what, what most definitely are the pioneering approaches to, to saving people's lives uh, through overdose prevention and the provision of naloxone. Okay. And I suppose just to give you an idea of the <coughs> local perspective for drug related deaths, when you're talking about the Scottish borders, it is one of the most rural and remote NHS board areas in 
the whole of Scotland. A NHS is the National Health Service. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I don't know if can't see it, but look, this huge area here is a uh, Scottish borders. And it has a population of approximately 112,000 people. Um, so the treatment service has about 500 referrals a year and at any time has about 250 people in service. So our average drug related deaths are approximately five a year. Um, yeah which on the scale of things doesn't sound like a huge number, but it's still five people's lives. And certainly in the borders, particularly, everybody's so well known. Um, so when yeah. one person dies in an area, it affects acquaintances, family members and friends all over the borders. Yeah. So. That's, a good, that's a good, and that's a good point get for Canada, um, because I mean, Canada is a huge country, we have a major, and that's a question we're gonna get into later, is the urban, versus rural issues and supplying harm reduction uh, to them. But um, now that we've gotten a bit of a background, uh, can we just get into a little bit about naloxone and sure. what it is um, and what it can do? Okay. So can we get a bit of a history? I mean, I've heard that it's been around for many years. It has, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, the actual substance itself uh, was actually first discovered in 1915. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's been around for a very long time. The first kind of reported uses of naloxone for the purposes of reversing overdose mm -hmm. was as early as 1954. Okay. Um, it was actually used to reverse um, a methadone overdose um, in 1954 and this was widely reported. Um, not a huge amount of uh, information related to naloxone for a number of years after that. But then in the, the 70s there was some talk about naloxone and its use. Uh, and that it should be provided to, to people who use drugs, and in particular opiates, so on and so forth. So, very long and extensive history, and, and to explain a bit about mm -hmm. this medication, if you like. In, in the UK, it's a prescription-only medication, exactly the same as in, in the United States and, and, and North America. Um, it's what's described as an opioid antagonist. Okay. Right? So, it, in, a, in essence, what this means is it works against the effects of opiate-based drugs, or opioids. And opiates are drugs, of course, like heroin, methadone, uh, oxycontin, um, uh, tramadol we have in this country, which is another powerful pain-relieving uh, medication, mm -hmm. all the codeine-based drugs. Um, so all of these drugs, fentanyl is another one as well, I'm conscious there was a, a massive issue in New York several years back. Um, Naloxone only works against those drugs. Um, it has no, it has no sedating effect. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give somebody a high or a stone. Um, it has no real potential for abuse. This is not a drug that we'll ever see with a street value. Okay. You know, that someone may trade. Okay. It has one purpose and one purpose alone, which is to reverse the effects of opiates. Okay. So the reality is. The majority of people who perhaps may even tune into some of this will have had naloxone administered into them, mm -hmm. perhaps as part of post-operative care. Ah, okay. Yeah, so maybe if, if opiate medications have been used during uh, an operation, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. then perhaps this has been used to bring up the respiration rate afterwards. Okay. That's its job. That's all it does. And can we just get into sorry, just how exactly it does it? Like it, little, there's some people that have some bit of more of a scientific background. Okay. Yeah, how does it work with the brain? Exactly? Okay. Well, well, the very simple way that I think we sometimes try to explain this during training sessions is, if we imagine the receptors that we have in, uh, in the pans region of our brain, mm -hmm. which is responsible for uh, respiratory function and respiration. Okay. When we use opiate drugs, the opiates go in there and essentially fit into these receptors, okay. and they fit perfectly because of course they're very similar to the endogenous opiates that we produce. Endorphins. Endorphins and the like, yeah. So they slot in there perfectly. It is uh, possible that an individual after using opiates can succumb to overdose. Mm -hmm. um, when we take naloxone and we inject it into the muscle, because what we do is we inject naloxone into the thigh muscle, mm -hmm. it travels up to this region of the brain, uh, gets up there via the bloodstream, and essentially what it does is it knocks the opiate off the receptor, yeah? Okay. And then places a cap over the receptor. Now this cap only lasts maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. That's mm -hmm. all. Um, and then eventually what will happen is the naloxone will wear off the receptor, meaning that the opiate can reattach. 
It's a myth that naloxone removes opiates from the body. It doesn't do that. It doesn't okay. do that at all. All it does is temporarily take the opiate off the receptor. Okay. So that's all it does. But a um, sort of a, something associated with that, I guess, would be that if you take naloxone and you are not in, in an overdose mm -hmm. situation, opiate overdose, there is not, there isn't really an effect on. No it. effect. So maybe if you're treating, if you come across someone you think they might have overdosed and you administer, you know, and a lot of the people administering yeah, yeah. are not necessarily trained professionals. Well, you know, paramedics, first responders, yeah. they have used naloxone along with other medications as a recess cocktail and I've used that for a number of years. Okay. So, I don't know if you've ever been found unconscious in the street, David, I don't know about your lifestyle, maybe that sometimes happens, <laughs> but it would be the case if you were found unconscious in the street. Um, and unresponsive and you would have an aloxone administered into you, whether it was opiate related or not, but it's really just to rule out the opiates because it's so safe. Yeah. And just going back to what Stephen said about the 20 to 30 minutes, yeah. after that period um, the opiates do go back on the receptors and the person is then potentially at risk again of overdosing. So sometimes it's you have to make it really clear in the training that if somebody has been administered naloxone and, and they come round, not to be using any more heroin or any other opiates because that Stack up. increases the risk even more of overdosing again. Okay. Yeah. Start the clock basically as well, you know, 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Well, yeah, you know, um, um, when, when somebody has naloxone administered into them, there is a potential that they start to experience withdrawal symptoms. Okay. Um, and we know that withdrawal is dose related. Withdrawal from naloxone? No, 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 withdrawal from the opiate. From the opiate. Yeah, because and if that's if we're talking about someone who is opiate dependent. Okay. So somebody who uses opiates on a daily basis has a, has a drug habit, for want of a better way of describing it. If you administer naloxone in, they may start to feel withdrawals. So when they come round, um, and we also have to remember the person doesn't know they've overdosed. Mm -hmm. They're going to be pissed off. Mm -hmm. yeah. What we've got to do then is assure them that, look, this is temporary. Um, the naloxone will wear off. Your stone will come back, and as Kirsten just said, there's a chance the OD could come back. Mm -hmm. So it's imperative that we still involve ambulances and we still get a person to the hospital to be checked over properly. Okay. Yeah. So this this buys time. Okay. That's its job. That's what it does. Okay. That's that's a good segue into. Um, so we just wanted to get into a little bit of a background on how. Um, if we really zoomed out a bit, we could say how drugs are managed in Scotland and the UK, but then zoom in a little more and just talk about where this program fits into emergency services and um, the wider sort of um, health system, I guess. So, but can you, can you tell us, so um, for Canadians this might be similar, we have a criminal code in Canada that's uh, throughout the country, but programs, you know, there's not necessarily, I mean, there's, there's different uh, jurisdictions that are responsible for different things. Sure. In Scotland, can you, can you just go into a little bit of detail about how that works? Yeah, um, it's, it's one of those unusual scenarios in Scotland. As I mentioned, you know, we are, uh, we are a devolved nation. We have our own government mm -hmm. um, based in this wonderful city of Edinburgh. <laughs> uh, and I'm not from Edinburgh, I'm from Glasgow, thankfully. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have uh, a devolved parliament here. Um, and many issues that would be uh, kind of that relate to our lives are of course uh, managed and policy is written in Scotland. So drug policy, for example, is devolved. Yeah, so so we have our own drug policy. Mm -hmm. um, medicines and how they are regulated, including uh, drugs like this, isn't devolved. Okay. So that sits with the Westminster government. Yes, yeah, it's, it's what they call a reserve matter as is the policing and the control of substance use. Mm -hmm. um, and by that what I mean is, you know, um, someone caught in Scotland with cannabis um, will face the same penalty as someone in England or Wales or Northern Ireland. Or, um, so some issues are devolved, others aren't. Um, drug policy uh, for, for uh, supporting people with drug problems uh, is called the Road to Recovery. Mm -hmm. So that was written by the Scottish Government and this is the policy that, that naloxone fits into. Okay. okay. Um, it was introduced what, 2010 as the a no national program. The naloxone yeah. program. There had been some pilot programs before. There had been one in Glasgow. Um, 
which started uh, about 2007 or so. Um, and then there was a, another excellent programme in Lanarkshire that, that came around just at the same time. And then in 2009 we had one in Inverness, which was way up there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was another fantastic programme. And it was actually because of that one that uh, one of our government ministers saw what was happening there. They saw lives being saved and decided, you know what, we need to make this a national programme. Mm -hmm. And 2010 uh, is when we launched a national programme. So can you, um, because in Canada, for example, um, uh, Insight, uh, which is well known, mm -hmm. I've yeah. learned from Stephen, is that it's well respected around the world. Hugely respected around the world, yeah, yeah. Um, it uh, was actually sort of came out of the efforts of drug users mm -hmm. groups, and was there a role that drug users have played in the Scottish? Definitely, yeah. yeah. I, I had mentioned that we have a national forum yeah. on drugs related death, this expert group. Well, we have people who use drugs who are members of that group, yeah, um, and they're standing members, they're there all the time. We also have a national volunteer forum in drugs related death, which is a group that I've been fortunate to facilitate. And again, it's a collective of people who've used drug services, mm -hmm. and it's a subgroup of the main forum. But to go back to uh, 2005, 2006, when the planning was being done for the introduction of the, the first pilot programs, mm -hmm. actually families were hugely influential in the creation of those initial pilot programs. Mm -hmm. Because these were people who were watching and witnessing their loved ones die. Mm -hmm. They knew that the law had been changed in the UK that, that meant that anyone can administer this to save lives. They knew that had happened. And they started asking, well, why can't I get this to save you know, another young person or, or someone I care about or love um, who might be overdosing and dying? So yeah, they played a massive part in this. Um, so what, so what, how does this program look now exactly. So we were talking about it's not, um, it's a take home. Program. Take home the law yeah. 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 So look, if you, can we get a few more details? Sort of? Well, I have to be honest, I, I work around the policy and the strategy and for the past 12 months a great deal of my time has been training trainers. Okay. Um, and and, and, and and, well, Kirsten's a local lead. Local yeah. lead okay. So there are a collective of local leads who then go on and, and implement their program. So when it comes to what does it look like on the ground, I guess that's for, for Kirsten. Right. Yeah, so the shape it takes. Yeah, so Stephen's right, what you've said, he came down and did the training for trainers with us in the borders. So we had a couple of training for trainer sessions. So that's the first stage, um, is mm -hmm. to get the workers trained up so that they can then train people in the use of the mm -hmm. Um so we started doing that and then we obviously raised awareness all throughout the borders and we set up our Facebook page, Borders Knock Zone. Is that that? Yes, I am. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> okay. um, so we set up the Facebook page and that was to um, engage as many people as possible so that people could look on the Facebook page, see how to contact us to be able to get supplies and then raising awareness all throughout the borders about the programme. So what we do now is um, anybody who accesses our service who is at risk of opiate overdose mm -hmm. will be trained and supplied with naloxone um, regardless of whether they are on a substitute opiate substitute therapy prescription okay. um, regardless whether they're on that or not um, because I think there's been difficulties in some other um, areas about people not supplying it to people who are on methadone or semi-sex. Ah, okay, okay. But that's just part of our remit. We give it to absolutely everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Also, regardless of whether they're seeing us as a treatment service or not, so anybody can access the service and they don't have to then continue on in treatment with us because a lot of people aren't ready or don't want to be accessing treatment services so they can see us out there. Mm -hmm. Um, the training itself is done either on a one-to-one -one basis with somebody which can be done in about 20 minutes, half so, an hour. So this would be training someone who will potentially administer in a lot? Yeah, okay. yeah. To, in order to be able to give them a supply, they have to do some basic okay. uh, overdose prevention training, naloxone, how it works, um, show them how to use the kit and have a practice with it. Give them some nice shiny leaflets. Give them some leaflets. Yeah. Then these are the kits that you administer, that you give out, right? Yeah. Um, it has been these ones, the yellow okay. ones. Um, oh, okay. but, um, we'll talk about that in a yeah, second. This, we we now have two kits on the go in Scotland, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second okay. and show you inside. 
Okay, so there's the one-at-one -one training that the nurses can do um, when they're um, just meeting somebody for their appointment, mm -hmm. or we can do group training as well. Um, group training normally lasts about an hour, a couple of hours, because it's, it's much more um, participatory and there's a lot more people there to, to give opinions and to um, be more involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're doing that. I think one of the... <sighs> One of the main things that I've noticed in the borders in particular is I, f I really feel like the naloxone programme is changing the culture of the way that the treatment services are viewed because it's it's changing that whole attitude. Um, being able to give somebody a supply of naloxone is really quite a powerful message, I feel. Yes. Um, and actually being able to give somebody something that says, you know, it, it does matter whether you live or die, that famous quote. Yeah. Um, it does, and it's getting that message across to people that we do care. Um, mm -hmm. so. See, I think there's an important point there that Kirsten's uh, starting to allude to. And, uh, and I guess it's the same in many places across the globe. Um, when we engage with people who use drugs, sometimes there are conversations that we don't really want to have. Yeah. You know, um, And talking about early and preventable death isn't always you know, the, the kind of conversation that we'll we want to have with an individual, it's not a nice place to be. No. Um, so, so what we found anyway, and what I find travelling around is that often workers and people who are in contact with those at risk, they don't really have these full uh, overarching conversations where they start to think, okay, let's unpack um, what risks you're exposing yourself to and let's actually come to understand why you might actually be ambivalent to life, mm. yeah? yeah? Why is it that you don't really want to die, but you no longer want to live? Because that often is reported back during sessions. And I think there's something quite magical, for want of a better word, that can happen when you have a worker, a person who potentially is at risk, and they, they develop this therapeutic alliance based on preventing death of that individual or people in their community. Yeah. Mm. And we've lost, I think we've lost some sight of that. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus now more on the later stages of the journey, you know, how are we going to support you into employment? Yeah. How are we going to help you reduce the amount of drugs that you take? Uh, how are we going to get you off of your OST, etc, etc? Yeah. And the wonderful thing about what we've got from our Scottish Government is, no, let's refocus back at this, this potentially deadly phase. Yeah, when someone is using chaotically, their self-esteem is on the deck. Um, they are stigmatised and vilified. Mm -hmm. They are marginalised, excluded from communities and feel worthless. And along comes somebody who says, you know what, I want to talk about the best way to help you look after yourself and stay alive and uh, uh, um, empower you to do the same for other people. It's magical. Yeah, and we're lucky we've got that from our government. Yeah, you know? it does send quite a message. It's very, very powerful. I would imagine there's a certain momentum because you guys have been saying, you know, naloxone has been used yeah. in in the borders as well. Yeah. yeah. And there um, are lives who that have been saved because there are people alive today yeah. purely down to the efforts of local leads, um, of local trainers, and of course their own efforts of engaging the program, learning the simple skills and administering them safely. Yeah. yeah. There are people alive. Because and I think going back to the local programme and setting it up, it's not difficult to set up a local programme. All you need is a few motivated staff and certainly we've been really lucky in the borders with some of our trainers because they're so motivated to keep this going. And I know that a few of them are watching tonight, uh, Gemma, Jill and Debbie especially, I know are watching and they, you know, they really make an effort to get as much knock zone out as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just Yes, it's up and running now, and it's um, you know it's active, and it's my job, I think, just to keep it at the forefront of people's minds and just keep people motivated about it and just mm -hmm. keep it going. But that's all it takes, really, is just a few motivated staff to, to get it up and running. And you know, I've had um, specific questions from people in Canada saying, "How can we get this here?" And um, I think you know, there's the broader question of who funds it and stuff, but I think that's. There's a lot of people that are going to be very happy to hear that. I'm very happy to hear that. You know that it, that you know it just takes the will, I guess. Yeah. To, um, it yeah. does. I mean, in our country, um, by the end of this year, the Scottish government will have invested uh, all, 
almost one million pounds, mm -hmm. one million pounds sterling, um, specifically to, to introduce this program. Now, I'm conscious as well via the Facebook page that, that there are perhaps a couple of questions relating to well, what comes after that. Yeah. And it's a perfectly legitimate and valid question. Um, and in all likelihood, in all likelihood, um, there will be monies around to make the kits available to pay for the kits. You know? yeah. See, this David costs ten pounds. Okay. Ten pounds sterling, which is what fifteen Canadian. <laughs> Can't be far away from fifteen Canadian, eh? I think that's about right. That's about right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you balance this against the cost of, of someone's life. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm conscious as well that this question about ah, but there has to be additional resources to keep these programmes going. The, and I wouldn't challenge that. Of course we're in a time of austerity, we have to prioritise how we spend our money. But you also have to ask yourself, if if it costs ten to fifteen pounds a kit, and each health board in Scotland, and we have is it thirteen health boards? Something like that. Each health board is responsible for paying for their kits. Mm -hmm. No health board would be any more than twenty, thirty thousand pounds a year. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of money, no. you know. Mm -hmm. So the initial investments to has been made to help start up the program, to carry out some research, to make this available in every prison in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So every prisoner gets access to this. Really, <coughs> but every prisoner who is identified as a potential risk, because it's still a prescription on the medication. Mm -hmm. Now, it is available in Canada. And just last night, uh, we exchanged uh, via Twitter the, uh, the information relating to Ottawa and the, the programme due to begin there. And again, people dedicated to saving lives will make this happen. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's not an expensive intervention. It takes will, it takes commitment, it takes motivation. Um, yeah, and at £10 a kit, you know, it's not expensive. So the whole thing about funding, I personally am not phased about that. Um, it will be the case that each health board will be responsible for managing their own take home the locks room program, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be hugely expensive in terms of the cost of the kits. What it does come down to is staff time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a different ball game. Um, and frankly above my pay grade. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um so just in terms of the, the naloxone programs and how it's been going, so lives have been saved, um, but what are some of the sort of hiccups that have come, what are, what are some things that are, you know, some difficulties, things that maybe if you guys really had your way and Westminster did exactly what you wanted to, let's say, but what, what, what could be going better? Yeah. <clears throat> I can tell you some local issues. Yeah. Um, just going back to what you said there about lives being saved, there's so far in the borders there have been seven successful reported reversals uh, using take home naloxone, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and we, what happens then is we encourage the person to come back, tell us a wee bit about it so we can gather some information about what they did, what happened, did they phone an ambulance, were the police involved? Um, we don't want any names um, about if uh, people aren't wanting to disclose names of who's overdosed and uh, who was around, that's fine. Um, but just gathering that information and giving them huge congratulations, it can be quite empowering for people as well to mm -hmm. be able to, to um, assist in saving somebody's life. So mm -hmm. um, that's great and there's been seven reported to us so far. Um, some of the local uh, difficulties that we've had, um, initially when we first started supplying the kits, um, people were opening them um, and squirting out the naloxone to use the syringes. Um, uh, okay. So that was the first issue that we, we kind of had. Um, obviously once the security seals are broken as well, the police can confiscate them. Okay. So there had been some being confiscated as well, um, just, just for people wanting to see in the boxes. Because before when we had the yellow boxes, I think just curiosity and people wanting to see what was well, in them. Well we have a look inside one of the kits then, yeah? Yeah. yeah. The, the kit that Kirsten's making reference to is this one, it's this kind of red yellow box. Um, this is the, the, the generic form of the drug, um, naloxone hydrochloride, one milligram per one milliliter. Um, it's manufactured um, by a company called Martindale Pharmaceuticals, previously called Orem, hence uh, the Orem logo there. When it leaves um, the manufacturer, what's inside the kit 
is essentially this. So we have a, a, a two milliliter um, pre-filled syringe okay. that is a glass syringe, but that's all that's there. So it leaves the manufacturer, it comes to Scotland, it goes to a third party assembler, which is another pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. They open up the kits and they put in them um, two 23-gauge inch and a quarter muscle I don't know what that is in Canadian money. <laughs> Just do inches? That's all my No, well, people, people understand inches. inches. Yeah. <laughs> two uh, 23 gauge inch and a quarter muscle needles. They take one of our patient information leaflets, which we'll have a look at in a second. Yeah. They close it over and they apply red security seals. Now, there are no other medications in the United Kingdom that require red tamper evident security seals. It's not about the medication, it's about who's getting it. Right? Yeah. Anyway, they put these seals on it, they put the label on it. That's what the individual gets, is the seal box. Kirsten's absolutely right. If you remove the tape, then there can be some ambiguity as to what's actually in the syringe. So the police could in theory confiscate. This is the pack we've had. Well, two years. Two years, maybe more than two years in fact, um, ever since the early pilots. What we're moving towards is this um, semi-see-through, slightly translucent kind of box. Again, I'll have the, the red security seals um, and the syringe is slightly different, I'll just show you. This is one of the syringes. If I take this off, I'll go with this one. Syringes are slightly different. Um, I'm, I know this isn't particularly clear for you, but um, with this one here, it was a simple question of simply you know, taking off this grey rubber cap. With this one, however, we have to, to twist this to take it off. It's called a lure lock, and you, you guys might be more familiar with that because I'm, I'm conscious that many products in Northern uh, America are fitted with lure locks, um, and we're starting to see more of that here. So, so this is fitted with a lure lock, and it's on this that the uh, 23 gauge muscle needle would fit on, simple twist, lock it on, and all we've got to do is slowly and simply remove this and the kit's good to go. That's it, ready to be administered to somebody to save their life. The product isn't ideal. Okay, it's not ideal. Okay. It's the best we've got. Um, and we've spent quite a bit of time liaising with uh, the manufacturer to try and have a more suitable product. And that's been a real stumbling block too. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it's very easy to say the product isn't fit for purpose. Yeah, which it wasn't, and it's gradually moving towards becoming more and more ideal. Um, and we would anticipate that in a few months' time we'll have the ideal product. So, mm -hmm. so we've got issues relating to that. There are weather issues relating to child protection. Okay. Yeah, there was this whole notion that anyone who might be at risk of uh, opiate-related overdose actually should go through a child protection assessment. Because, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're aware of is the people who are at greatest risk are the people who are perhaps less likely to be willing to go through that process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's still, still an issue that comes up now and again, but generally we have to just give people information. Let them know that this isn't dangerous. Um, if a kid get their hands on an naloxone kit, manage to assemble it and administer it, there would be no harm. <laughs> Okay. The biggest harm yeah. and the biggest risk, if you like, and the thing we need to understand is how does a kid know how to assemble yeah. a two milliliter syringe and needle? Um, but it presents no real harm to the child. Which there's very few medications out there yeah. that you could say that about. This is safer than paracetamol. Okay. I don't. I'm not familiar with the other drugs. So you, yeah. where does naloxone fit into the? Naloxone uh, on, is on the same list of medications as drugs like uh, epinephrine, <coughs> which um, if you were experiencing anaphylaxia as a result of allergy, yeah. I could administer epinephrine into you legally to save your life. Yeah? Um, so it's, 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 it's on the same list of medications that are exempt um, from you know, a person being prosecuted for administering it to save lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, very safe and effective medication. Another drug that sits there as well um, would be, uh, uh, you know, someone who is diabetic might need insulin. Yeah. So again, this is one of those drugs that I could administer into Kirsten to save her life, you know, if she was unable to do that. Um, 
So yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's widely recognised the UK is perfectly safe from that. Um, and I don't know if that was, that was going to answer the question that you were asking about where it fits. Yeah. Um, well, there's other, just in terms of other anti-opiates. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. You might have heard of naltrexone. And I know from the Facebook thing there was some reference made to long-acting implants. Those would be naltrexone, which is similar to naloxone. Um, comes in a tablet form or an implant but lasts anywhere from, what, 24 hours up to, well, we hear about 30 days now, don't we? You can get the implants lasting as long as that. Okay. Um, so very similar in terms of our actions, the brain, but the duration of the effect is much shorter with this, much shorter. Is that, a, is that a strength or a weakness, or is that a secondary concern to the fact that it's just so... Well, that's a good, it's a good question, and the reality is this is not a treatment for sure. opiate use. Right. This is not a treatment. This is a first aid intervention. Yeah. yeah, and and actually, uh, friends around the world um, that, that I've certainly spoken with, uh, you know, the best approach to take if we are dealing with legislators, policymakers, is to approach it from that angle. That this is first aid. Why is this not available? Yeah. Um, and actually, that seems to have helped us uh, garnish support in areas and quarters that we probably wouldn't have. You know, the police. Uh, it's yeah. a very supportive of this because it's first aid. Yeah. No? yeah. Can we can we talk a bit about <coughs> the United Nations and uh, yeah. what recently happened with Naloxone, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually how this happened was we were all tweeting about it, and uh, I said, hey, what about a Naloxone interview? And what do you know? So <laughs> we have one, yeah. Um, but this was all surrounding the United Nations um, in it was in Vienna. It was in Vienna, yeah. yeah. It was the fifty fifth meeting of the Commission of Narcotic Drugs in Vienna. Um, the CND is the central drug policy making body of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. um, from what I, I'm led to believe, it's not always the most enjoyable meeting to attend. Uh, <laughs> in fact, lots of folks, uh, perhaps... Um, I, from following the Twitter, I would say it was there were a lot of frustrated people yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's less supportive of harm reduction than perhaps we would like it to be, and certainly less vocal about that support. Okay. Um, anyway, that, that, at CND 55 there was a, a, a resolution that was tabled, there was a paper tabled uh, that made reference to overdose prevention um, and included uh, a reference to naloxone provision uh, and that was the first time that that had been made um, to CND uh, and bizarrely, surprisingly, thankfully uh, it was passed. Mm -hmm. So this was actually a motion that was tabled by, I think it was Israel and Denmark, I think it was. Um, it was co-sponsored and yeah, you know, the, the recommendation is that all EU member states, part of the United Nations, should look at their national policies around overdose prevention um, and seek to include in the lot of them. Really powerful stuff. Really powerful stuff. So how, how did it happen? Like how did it, um, so Israel, Denmark tabled it, but it, and you said it was the first time it was tabled. I mean, that's pretty, that's interesting that it made it through on the first round, or is it? There are organizations like uh, INPUT, okay. uh, International Network of People Who Use Drugs, and of course, uh, Harm Reduction International, mm -hmm. um, and various other activist kind of groups that support harm reduction, who have of course been lobbying and calling for this very long time, very, very long time. Yeah. People like Alan Clear at Harm Reduction Coalition in New York, um, and I think, uh, as we were highlighting earlier, you know, even the, the, the Canadian uh, Coalition, I think, has been involved uh, in, in calling for stronger action to, to, to save people's lives. So yeah, it's surprising, but I think just the weight behind it, and it's almost, it's almost unequivocal now, the evidence base, yeah. that naloxone can be distributed safely and lives can be saved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eliza Leela, the DOPE project, uh, was someone who was recently involved in uh, the Centre for Disease Control report, which highlighted, you know, 50 odd thousand naloxone kits put out there, more than 10,000 uses. I mean, you know, huge numbers. Yeah. Um, and I think bodies like CND are, are starting to have to recognise, well, you know, this is actually happening and we can deny, we can stand back and claim we need more evidence, or we can we can get on board and do what we can to save lives. And so I'd like to think it was that. Um, perhaps it didn't go far enough, 
But as always, future means. But the but where it is now is because of the hard work of people who have been saying this and doing this and yeah. Well, we the Scottish program, I think, by and large, came from Chicago. Okay. Um, it was a multi-agency, multidisciplinary visit to the Chicago Recovery Alliance um, yeah. and meeting people at Dan Big. You know, and since 2001, 2002, people at Dan Big and Sars Maxwell, who uh, Kirsten was quoting earlier there, you know, they've been making this stuff available and saving lives. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see now, a whole range of different projects continually asking for, for more action and to make naloxone available. Um, unfortunately, this injectable preparation is the only preparation that has proper licensing. Okay. Yeah. I know we all like the idea of the intranasal, but there is no licensed intranasal naloxone product. So. Okay. Um, I just really wanted to um, go back to the rural versus urban issue because that's really you know important in both of our well, it's important everywhere, I'm sure. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that and how, you know, accessing users? Because in terms of setting up a program, that's one thing, but in terms of actually going from that to saving lives, you know, there's, and, you know, as you're saying, what, it, there's the committed people, but there's a little bit more to it than that, right? And especially in a rural area, or? Yeah, well, we can't expect people to travel miles to come and get Nox on from us, so we okay. have to, we travel throughout the borders to be available for people to access our service. Right. So, I mean, there has been um, cases where people have had to wait over 20, 30 minutes for ambulances in the borders because it is such a rural area. Yeah. Um, so these are the people who are definitely needing to have supplies and also available yeah. to them. Um, we have drop-in sessions all over the borders that um, people can access. So we've not had too much of a difficulty in people being able to get to us but the main difficulty that we've had is trying to get people who are not actually in service to come along um, mm -hmm. and just getting that message to them to come out as well has been probably the most challenging. And you, uh, which I thought was fantastic, you mentioned quite recently about approaching, um, we have alcohol and drug partnerships who are responsible for the, the, the provision of service to a certain extent, you know, strategically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kirsten had approached him, I think, looking for an outreach bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to be able to have like a harm reduction bus to be well, going about. Uh, we have outreach. this actually. You guys already yeah, have that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, in some, uh, they're mostly in the cities, I think. I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not as full, as aware. Um, but uh, it's something that has has been done. Um, uh, I think it's more with needle exchanges, though. Yeah. But it is, yeah, it's a great go to the people. But yeah, it could have everything on it, needle exchange and oh, yeah. socks on it. <laughs> I think that's exactly it. You know, overdoses don't necessarily happen in the full view of people. We know witnesses are often there, but overdoses don't happen there. We need to assure that naloxone is where overdoses happen. Mm -hmm. Not where we would like them to happen, and not when the person eventually gets to the hospital. We're not going to achieve that unless we have individuals, uh, you know, and, and collections of individuals within local areas who are doing what, what I would like to call proactive inreach. Mm -hmm. So actually reaching into communities. I know we use outreach, but I prefer inreach. Actually reaching in, into the places. In, in reach. Yeah, know. yeah. Reaching the places where drug users are and bringing uh, the harm reduction uh, initiatives and interventions to them. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of drug users don't like approaching services, understandably. Yeah. So we have to go to them. Yeah. For sure. Is um, <coughs> and I thought it was really interesting how you're saying that a lot of your um, strategy was a Facebook page, and uh, and it seems like that was great. It was a huge success for you. Yeah, it's been yeah. really good. It's been really good for networking with other people as well, but it's also been good because word of mouth is great in the borders as well. So um, once a couple of people join the Facebook page, you know, it soon gets about. And so so there is already a social network, and then the Facebook yeah. sort of yeah. <laughs> piggyback. And up. then a lot of people have said as well, you know, that they're not that keen on joining it um, because they don't really want to be kind of associated. But then they can. They're the ones that are saying that they're going onto the page to look anyway and see what's happening. So this is one of the reasons that we, um, and again through Scottish government funding, 
um, have taken the decision to set up uh, a new website, um, naloxone.org.uk. I'll say it again, naloxone.org.uk. <laughs> One more time for the cheap seats, <laughs> naloxone.org.uk. And anyway, anyway, the reason for the establishment of this is we're aware that, um, certainly across Scotland, people need a centralised resource that they can tap into and get information relating to naloxone. You know, and, and the many uh, forms that they might need it. So there'll be videos there, there'll be interactive tools there, there'll be downloadable resources. And, and we would like that to have, of course, a Scottish focus, but, but actually our, our friends and colleagues right across the world, we would like them to be able to access this site and help us populate it, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's see the great work that's being done to make the locks on available. So the Facebook stuff is great, it's fantastic. Um, and I'd like to think that the website will, will, will just be another additional resource that uh, anyone anywhere in the world can access um, to help get messages out there about saving lives with this drug, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a good resource. Okay. Yeah, that's... So I'll be plugging it. So, Sorry. <laughs> um, in terms of... Um, and I just want to go back to something because this was something that came up on the Facebook page a lot is the funding and you talked about you know the funding and how it's disappearing. Sure. What um, <coughs> what is the best way for a program to you know to manage a program that has temporary funding? What what how should you do that? You know, what what are the, what's the way to be successful to do that? And uh, certainly the experience of of. Uh, Scotland and, and it's interesting, I, I do some work with the Eurasian Harm Reduction Net Network and uh, some work in Estonia just now and they're, they're looking to establish a steering group, mm -hmm. yeah, so get a hold of the, the key stakeholders that are required, get them around the table, so you'll have the police there, you'll have pharmacy there, you'll have obviously policy makers, you'll have families, you'll have people who use drugs, service providers, etc, etc. We need these groups to be formed so that they can draw up the work plan of, of what they intend to do. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the resource, we have to be mindful that, you know, paying for staff is probably the biggest cost. It's not the naloxone, it's paying for the staff to do it. And this may seem slightly controversial, but we have a, a huge resource that tragically remains untapped, and that's people who use drugs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Peer-led distribution is absolutely without a doubt the way to go. Yeah, it's a cheap, ineffective, uh, inexpensive um, intervention, and if we use that resource, that that gold mine that exists, then we could easily be putting an naloxone out, and it costs them very little to do it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because it's current status, you know, uh, non-clinical people can't supply it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that people who use drugs, or their friends, families, whatever, can't be involved in actually delivering the training, and then the clinician, the, the trained nurse or whatever, comes in to make the supply. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the direction we should be moving in. There's a key phrase that comes from input. Yeah. Um, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would suggest that any program across the globe that looked to start itself up, that should be part of you know the mantra for it. It should always involve people who use drugs. They should be uh, intrinsic to its direction and sustain them, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We can easily demonstrate to, to governments and funders, we put out this number of kits and about 10% of them have been used in any given year. Mm -hmm. So if we put out 10,000 kits, we would expect to see 1,000 uses. Yeah. You don't need any more evidence for a small amount of funding to keep a thing going than that. You don't, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and that, that's a theme that um, is, is coming up a lot in Canada as well, um, especially with our drug, uh, the Vancouver Drug Users Union, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the role that they have played, in, you know, in, in just many of the different things. There's actually something uh, the, the uh, that came out of the Naomi Project and the serious ethical questions uh, in terms of, you know, when you have um, something that's sort of viewed as an experiment that involves people, mm -hmm. you know, you have to make sure and. This uh, this group um, is I wish I could remember the name exactly, uh, but they came out of the Naomi Project and they're really being vocal and they've actually just published a paper which is on the CDPC website, Canadian Drug Policy Coalition's website, uh, or there's a link to it there. Um, but really talking about you know the role that that this and I, and this was a this is a theme is you know every different level that you know every different level that's involved you must have drug users otherwise. 
What's the point? Yeah. It shouldn't be the case that this is something that's done to um, people who use drugs. This should be something that is shaped um, in partnership with, because it's about drug users. It's about it's about people who use drugs being empowered um, uh, to to save potentially their loved ones' lives. You know, people in their communities, um, and it's a massive resource that is left untapped. There's a huge amount of commitment and activism. I mean, even in every area, you know, mm -hmm. there's a desire to be involved, so we have to use it. We have two peer trainers in Borders at the moment who've been involved in awareness sessions and um, helping deliver some of the training to people as well. But it's definitely something that we need to work a lot more on and expand. Mm -hmm. that. Apart from uh, an increased involvement of people who use drugs, is there anything else, you know, the Canadians watching who want to see this, uh, you know, a naloxone program in Canada and push this further? Is there any sort of Advice or final words, we're almost at yeah, eight, 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 eight o'clock. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, um, there is the, the global I'm the evidence campaign that's, that's yeah. taking place at the moment. Um, input, Eurasian Harm Reduction Network, um, and various others are, are involved in collecting evidence. Um, gather the evidence that exists out with Canada. Um, I guess it's also a question of you know, speak to, to drug users and their families. Let them know that this particular medication is available. Um, you know, get their support. Start to engage with locally elected members, uh, members of administrations or governments. Ask them what action can be taken. We see that actions taken in other countries. Could we explore taking this action here? Um, and be prepared for several setbacks, lots of hurdles, um, and barriers to be put in front. Um, but none of them are insurmountable. None of them cannot be driven through, uh, particularly if you, you develop that activist voice locally. Uh, you know, let people know that their lives and the lives of people who use drugs don't have to be to be lost. Um, and also go on to nilobson.org.uk because there will be loads of resources there. And one more thing, is, and you're saying, I just want to go back though, you're saying that the Framing it as a first aid. It's a first aid. Yeah. It's what it is. It's first aid. Yeah. It doesn't replace calling ambulances. Um, it's, you know, used an analogy quite recently as well. You know, um, I drive a car. Uh, in, in the 60s or so, it became mandatory for all cars to have seat belts. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It was in the 80s in the UK anyway, it became law to wear a seat belt. Now people do that without hesitation, without thinking. Granted, some of them still drive like maniacs. Some will drive uh, under the influence, but we know that doing that reduces the chances of death should a collision happen. Mm -hmm. It's not about stopping crashes. Naloxone doesn't stop overdoses. Mm -hmm. Naloxone just reduces death, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to see it for what it is, simply first aid. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's the only piece of first aid that will actually work um, uh, for an opiate related overdose. So that has to be available as that. Okay. I think that's where we stop. Thanks to both of our guests for uh, a fantastic interview. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I've learned a lot, and I hope you guys are good too. Let's see how many people we have here. Five. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thank you. Bye.